We now continue our look at Aristotle's metaphysics. Now, one of Aristotle's many contributions to philosophy is substance. For him, a substance is an individual thing, a single entity. And to quote a translation of his work, he describes a substance or substances as this. They are the entities which underlie everything else, and everything else is either predicated of them or present in them. And this is from his work, The Categories. So, for Aristotle, substances have two key attributes. Well, I can't say properties, for reasons we'll see later when we talk about substances and substrata. So, first, a substance is a subject to which is predicated the other categories. So, he's following the you know, subject predicate structure, and the subject is what you're talking about describing, and what you predicated of that, the predicate, is the quality that it has. So if you say the apple is red, the apple would be the subject, the predicate would be red, and so on for you know other examples of qualities, like the, um, uh, the cat is furry, cat would be subject, furry, predicate, and so on. So kind of the first thing is, is there the thing that has properties? The second feature is that according to Aristotle, Substances can exist apart from specific properties, but properties can't exist apart from a substance, which is why they can exist on their own. To use the usual example of you know the, the apple, the apple can exist if it loses you know certain properties. For example, it could be a red apple, but it could um, you know start going bad and you know change change color. It'd still be an apple, a, you know, a spoiled or rotten apple, but it'd still be an apple. But the property of red can exist apart from the substance. So you could have a red apple or a red truck or a red balloon, but you couldn't just have red by itself, as far as we know. So those are the two main attributes of substance, which are used by philosophers later on, namely a thing that holds, uh, bears up, or has other properties, or has properties. And then the other is that it's something that can exist on its own, distinct from properties. Properties supposedly can't just exist on their own, but substances can. So now we turn to some of Aristotle's first principles. Now in arguing for this, these first principles, he uses a classic um, regress argument. Hence the little recycling symbol there. He asserts that it's not possible to prove everything deductively. And you might recall that deductive logic uh, is when you draw an inference uh, and your goal is to make it valid such that if all the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. And so the idea would be is that you'd have this guaranteed true conclusion if it's valid and all your premises are true. So why can't we prove everything deductively? Well, his reasoning is this. If everything had to be proven deductively, you'd get an infinite regress would arise. Because deductive proofs would require first principles, premises that do not require any support. Because if you didn't have them, then you'd have to, you know, you'd have to prove the first principle. But then you have to prove the proof of the first principle then you have to prove the proof of the proof of the first principle, and so on to infinity. So the way you stop the regress, or the way Aristotle did it, was saying, well, there's got to be first principles. Going back to our notion of methods, this would involve taking them as primitive. Again, not in the sense that they're you know, armed with you know, stone knives, um, you know, low tech, etc., but in the sense that they're not analyzed, they're not explained. And this is a pretty standard regress argument. And every theory has to have some things that are not explained. Otherwise, the theory would, would be, have to be an infinite theory, which would be impossible. So he concludes, we've got to have first principles. And for the most part, people who aren't complete skeptics, that is to say, those who claim that it seems as if we don't have any knowledge, would generally have to accept there must be some first principles we you know, accept without support. So... What are the first principles not? 
Well, in addressing the ancient skeptics, and if you take the intro to philosophy class or the epistemology class, you learn a lot about the skeptics. One uh, thing that the skeptics raised as a challenge was that if you had a first principle, it would have to be just arbitrary, so useless, effectively. But Aristotle says first principles are not arbitrary because he knows that you know, he's aware of the skeptics, that if they were arbitrary, there'd be no basis for scientific necessary knowledge, that arbitrary first principles would be unprincipled and so effectively useless. Secondly, he argues that they're not innate. They're not built in. One of the many uh, two-sided battles in philosophy is between the empiricists and the rationalists. And as we saw before, the empiricists, strict empiricists claim there's no innate knowledge. Everything you know about the world comes from the senses, and rationalists allow that you know at least some things by pure reason, and they typically accept innate ideas that they're built in. And if you take the class in epistemology, you'll see that battle play out across the centuries. So Aristotle rejects the idea that these first principles are innate. And his argument for this is later borrowed, or rather stolen, by thinkers like John Locke, later empiricists. And he says this, It would be absurd to think people would have this knowledge from birth, just built in, without being aware of it. And it's an argument later developed again in more detail by John Locke. His argument against the ideas is that if you get them, you should be aware of them. If you travel around the world in the seven seas and ask people about these supposedly innate ideas, um, a lot of people, most people who aren't philosophers, would have no idea what one is talking about. So for him, these first principles are essentially assumptions. You don't, don't have to prove deductively. They're not arbitrary, he claims, and they're not innate. So, how do we find out about the features of the world? Well, this takes us to induction. So, again, we're working with trying to get to the first principles. So, for Aristotle, induction reveals the universal and necessary features in a changing world of particulars. So, how do we do this? Well, he lays out kind of a scientific and also obviously philosophical account of this. So we have these sensory experiences, you know, seeing, hearing, etc. And what happens is, to use a metaphor, they leave traces in our memory. If you want to use an analogy or another metaphor, the idea would be uh, kind of like wearing a path. Um, if you've you know, seen places where people walk across uh, the grass on campus, if they keep walking and walking and walking, eventually it wears wears down, and you have just you know just dirt there. And you can kind of think of memory kind of that way. The more the more you experience the same things, the more it strengthens the traces. The more it wears down the trail. And so Aristotle thinks that this is the starting process by which you get knowledge of universal qualities. The idea is that eventually you know the to use my metaphor, the wear down uh, makes a you know clear path. He uses the metaphor of a of a battle. He says, um, like a root in battle, stopped by first one man making a stand, and then another until the original formation has been restored from his posterior and looks. The idea being that you know you've got people panicking, you know the formation falls apart, and back in those uh, those days. Organized uh, military units would fight in formations. Uh, later, of course, you know the, the the Romans had developed this, and then the formation fighting would last for quite a long time. And key to being successful was maintaining formation. And so, in Aristotle's uh, analogy or metaphor, the idea is that you know if a formation falls apart, uh, sometimes it can be restored by you know one person taking a stand, another, another until the formation is restored. And so, in his analogy, is kind of like that. Um, except, of course, there's like, initially the, the fall apart, and then the formation gets built. Now, the process he describes here is one later borrowed by our good dead friend, St. Thomas Aquinas, and becomes, uh, as you might imagine, something of a point of contention among philosophers. So as he sees it, the universals are in the world. 
Plato took them to be, you know, in his Platonic heaven, somehow being instantiated here. But for Aristotle, they're somehow in the particulars. And what would happen is, as you have more and more experience with, with particulars, your mind, through this kind of mysterious process, extracts the universals from the particulars. And it gets better and better at this, and does so with ever-increasing levels of generality. And his view is, ultimately, you'd reach his categories. No, his categories, of course, because it's, it's his view. And so the idea is, is that there's... You know, universals properties out in the world, say like, you know, red or catness. Not the character from Hunger Games, but the property of being a cat. And to use a, you know, kind of a concrete example involving cats, you'd look around and see a lot of cats. And your mind would uh, gradually, you know, extract the universal cat from particulars. And then eventually keep generalizing, get the concept of, you know, cat. And then generalize and generalize more until it reached the, the categories. So the way we do this, according to Aristotle, is through induction. We're engaged in inductive generalizations. We make observations of you know, a certain number of samples, that's our sample set, and then we generalize from that. So we would observe, you know, again, going with example, you observe um, so many you know, dogs, and then you generalize from the dogs you've observed to dogs that you haven't observed, attributing from various qualities. And that's a classic form of inductive reasoning. And he believes you use this inductive reasoning, and then you have to add to this intuitions to get what he calls the first principles. So induction for him is the beginning of forming these first principles. So what about intuition? Well, for him, here's how intuition works. Aristotle believes that the world or rather did, because he's pretty dead now, that the world has a rational order. And this is a point of debate among you know, people who do metaphysics and science about whether the world has order or not. Now, you could have order without any cause of the order. So it could have an order on, you know, without a purpose behind it, but still be orderly. So Aristotle takes the view that the world has a, not just an order, but a rational order to this. Now, our experience does not prove this order, but does acquaint us with the order. So how do we get beyond our experience? Well, we do, at least according to Aristotle, and this will sound you know, somewhat similar to Plato, we use an intellectual intuition. And this enables us to go beyond the particulars to the universal and necessary truths that are the ultimate foundations of knowledge. So you got, you know, essentially experience about the world. You observe, you know, many things that have qualities. Through this inductive generalization, you get to the categories. And then according to Aristotle, you would use this intellectual intuition to get beyond the particulars to these universal necessary truths that do provide the foundation of knowledge. So the universals we end up with are not based on the particulars, but it's it is our experience of the particulars that inspires this intuition that takes us beyond induction. So whereas our good dead friend Plato relied on the recollection, in which, you know, which he describes in the dialogue of the Mino, Aristotle replaces recollection from a time you know, when one was dead with recognition. The mind recognizes the universals within experience. And according to him, we get two principles revealed through this induction plus intuition. We get those of science and those of logic. So what is the difference between these two sets of principles? Well, the principles of science are these. They are, as you might imagine, the fundamental principles and definitions of the sciences. And these would include those in math, medicine, and physics. And which may seem surprising to people today, Aristotle also considered ethics to be a science as well. Although today we classify ethics as uh, you know, humanities. But Aristotle, and if you take uh, the ethics class or are familiar with Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, he does regard it as, as a science, not just in terms of just stuffing in there arbitrarily, 
but he does consider it to meet the qualifications for a science. The second set of first principles are those of logic. According to Aristotle, they're the fundamentals of all reasoning, and they cross all subjects. So logic would be universal. And this is something that uh, not everyone accepts, because pretty much anything in philosophy, you can't say that everyone accepts it, uh, because there's always somebody, at least one person, who disagrees. But pretty much everyone accepts that logic works you know, across all reasoning. In, in a way, you could argue that it's kind of by definition, because if you're reasoning, you've got to be using some form of logic. So what are the first principles of logic? Well, Aristotle presents uh, three critical fundamental principles. And in large part, uh, they're still accepted today. But again, as you'd imagine, there are people who reject um, some or, or all of them. And if you take a logic class today, you'll, you'll probably learn these principles. The first one is this. It's called the law of non-contradiction, which is that A cannot be both B and not B. Now, he doesn't mean that something, you know, can't have, you know, sort of different, you know, qualities. For example, you can say that a shirt could be both, you know, red and not red because parts of it may not be red. He doesn't mean in that. Uh, he would mean that something, um, you know, could not, you can't have a shirt that's like entirely red and entirely not red, which leads to debates and philosophy about, you know, how, you know, is that really a contradiction? How would that work, etc.? But the law of non-contradiction, again, generally accepted even today by most people who do logic, that something cannot be both a thing and not that thing. Again, laying aside the things that can be combined. Like you could have, you know, like a, um, uh, you know, you can think of like an example of like a food. You could have a, um, an omelet, you know, part of it is meat, part of it is not meat, uh, that type of thing. Um, but you can't have an omelet that is both an omelet and not an omelet. Second is the law of excluded middle, that A must be either B or not B. So something, you know, must either be, say, an omelet or not an omelet. Now, again, if someone brings an example saying, well, you know, oh, what if you have a shirt that's, you know, got red paint on it, so it's like red and also not red? Well, Aristotle, you know, he'd, he'd easily handle that. He'd say, well, yeah, you know, the, the the shirt as a whole has some red on it and some not red. But the part that's red can't be, you know, it's either red or not red, and it can't be both red and not red. It's a matter of, of scope. And again, there's a debate about, about, about that, of course. His final law is the law of identity, that A is A, that each thing is what it, what it is, which is pretty broadly accepted. Uh, almost, again, almost everyone accepts this. And so those are his key fundamental principles of logic. Non-contradiction, that A cannot be both B and not B. Law of excluded middle, A must be either B or not B. And the law of identity, A is A. And Aristotle takes this to describe, you know, the laws of thought, the laws of language, and the laws of reality. Because Aristotle believed that thought, language, and reality all have the same structure the same underlying logic, or so he claimed. So that takes us to the end of his first principles, and next we'll head into uh, what we'd you know, call most strictly his metaphysics.